We're going to hold questions till uh, the, the case sessions, which will follow this uh, quick talk. And um, uh, a lot of the topics that we are, uh, have been discussed already by Dr. Kreiner and, and Dr. Rosenwasser, we'll, we'll go over th with the uh, case discussions too. So my topic was um, dysarrhage fractures with compartment syndrome and neurovascular injury, and I decided to focus it more on dysarrhage fractures with acute carpal tunnel syndrome. The reason being is that that's the most common uh, variant of neurovascular injury that we come across with dysarrhage fractures. And dysarrhage fractures are fun topics because they're common fractures, there's a lot of nuances to them, a lot of variables to consider, a lot of ways to treat them. And fortunately, uh, fortunately they tend to be relatively forgiving fractures. Um, so something we study a lot and talk about a lot. Um, and a lot of different things to consider. So what we're going to consider and discuss here is acute carpal tunnel syndrome. So uh, some disclosures, uh, nothing relevant to uh, today's talk. Um, so uh, just one slide on dysarrhage fractures. It's very common. We know it's the most common uh, fracture of the upper extremity. It's increasingly treated surgically. Uh, it, the threshold to treat these fractures surgically has decreased significantly uh, over the past many years, and there's a lot of variables that go into that. Um, and when it comes to carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, that's also a very common condition of the upper extremity. Uh, it's the most common uh, peripheral neuropathy uh, of the upper extremity, um, actually of the body. Um, um, and uh, the prevalence in the general population of, of carpal tunnel syndrome is 5 to 7 percent. So it's very common. I'm sure many people in this room right now have some amount of carpal tunnel syndrome. So it's a very common condition. And when we talk about this, we need to make a distinction of what type of carpal tunnel syndrome. The most common type is idiopathic carpal tunnel syndrome. I use the analogy of idiopathic hypertension. It's the type that you get without a specific identifiable cause in contrast to a secondary carpal tunnel syndrome, which is really what we're going to focus on today. So idiopathic carpal tunnel syndrome, about 5 to 7 percent. Now, carpal tunnel syndrome as a product of a distal radius fracture has been quoted to be as high as uh, 5 to 9 percent. Uh, and that's what we're going to focus on today. So when we talk about carpal tunnel syndrome related to a, a fracture of the distal radius, um, we can divide into three categories, acute, subacute, and delayed. So acute means just that. The symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome began uh, immediately following or soon following uh, the fracture itself. Subacute means the, the symptoms started to develop days to weeks following uh, the fracture. And delayed means that it started in technically 6 to 12 months after the fracture. Um, we're going to focus again on acute because that's where we have to make a little bit more decision making on the front end as to how to proceed, what to do, how to manage uh, the fracture as well as the issue with uh, the nerve compression. So let's first look at what are some of the risk factors. Who, what what uh, patient of yours in the emergency room are you going to be a little bit more concerned about that this patient might have uh, some car uh, might develop uh, or and or have uh, acute carpal tunnel syndrome. Well, there's a few things. So first of all, a higher energy injury puts you at a higher risk for uh, acute carpal tunnel syndrome. A fracture with greater displacement uh, and or greater deformity uh, puts you at higher risk for carpal tunnel uh, acute carpal tunnel syndrome. A non-osteoporotic fracture, and that's just another way of saying a, a higher energy injury in someone with, with n more normal bone density. Multiple close reduction attempts, so someone who underwent uh, multiple attempts to get the fracture reduced, each of those manipulations, uh, possibly additional hematoma blocks can all lend themselves to um, uh, more swelling and uh, nerve injury. Comminution of the, fr uh, of the fracture itself, and that could be because uh, it represents greater energy or it may actually be uh, causing the acute CTS because of cortical or bony uh, fragment pressure upon the nerve directly, and then a polytrauma situation which also kind of implies a higher energy injury. So these are some risk factors you'll, that when you see these you may dr uh, drop your threshold to make that diagnosis of acute CTS. So what are you going to see when you see someone in the emergency room with acute CTS? So first of all, carpal tunnel syndrome, just for what the normal carpal tunnel syndrome, is a numbness, tingling, uh, a parasthetic feeling that develops in the median nerve distribution of the hand, so that's the thumb, index, middle finger, part of the ring finger, the uh, inside radial border of the ring finger. Typically, you'll see that uh, what patients will tell you when they have acute carpal, I'm sorry, with idiopathic carpal tunnel syndrome is that they'll get these symptoms intermittently during the day. The most common times people will complain of it are nighttime, what we call nocturnal symptoms, awakening them up at nighttime. Uh, they'll get it um, with certain activities such as driving, uh, 
uh, holding things in their hand, holding a book, holding a phone, holding a hair dryer. These things will often precipitate those, that, those feelings. And it's typically a numb, uh, tingly feeling. Some people will say it's a, it's a pain. Uh, technically, it's not a pain, but again, I don't really argue that point in, again, the idiopathic case. But so that's what an idiopathic is. And when you're dealing with, uh, with an acute uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, it's the same distribution of numbness, the same area, but unlike with idiopathic carpal tunnel syndrome, that numbness tends to have a more painful quality and also may have a little bit more of a progressive quality to where they'll see those symptoms rising more rapidly, being more bothersome. So it's the same distribution. Um, and, but it's a little bit more painful, a little bit more progressive. The other thing you'll notice is an altered sensation. So this is a picture of using the SEMS Weinstein monofilament test. <coughs> Ultimately, just even light touch may be altered. The SEMS Weinstein uh, testing will be altered. Two-point discrimination may be altered. Again, looking at the uh, median nerve distribution of the hand, and the best place to text, uh, test this is the index finger because index finger is, a, uh, is an autogenous zone for the median nerve. So there's really no crossover there, so that's a nice area to test, the, uh, test for sensation uh, because it's only the median nerve that's going to provide any feeling to that area. So if it's altered, they'll notice it there. Another way to test for uh, acute CTS is thenar motor weakness. Frankly, I think in an acute setting with the distal fracture, this is actually a very hard test to do. In this picture, the, the examiner is grabbing the wrist pretty hard to stabilize the hand. You can imagine grabbing someone with a broken wrist. That's not going to make a lot of sense. However, uh, it is a potential uh, clinical finding is weakness to thenar abduction, abduction, to bring the thumb up in the palm and testing that, that strength. That can be weakened. But again, I think in a setting of an acute injury with a fracture, that's not going to be very useful and plausible. The other test is a positive stretch test. That means actually pulling the fingers back. It's a little bit like, uh, uh, somewhat analogous to a leg compartment syndrome where the pressure is great and you can uh, flex and extend the toe. And that excursion and that stretch in the muscle belly causes some pain. A little bit analogous to that as well where you may elicit some symptoms. This too, I think, is not a particularly good test because again, in the setting of a fracture, deformity, uh, the, the whole area hurts a lot to begin with, so difficult to tell sometimes if that's actually due to acute CTS or just the fracture itself. So what causes acute CTS in the setting of a distal fracture? Well, fundamentally, it's pressure. So in the normal pressure in the carpal tunnel is about three to five millimeters of mercury. When you have an acute CTS situation, the pressure is usually above 20. Once you're above 20, you start to have symptoms that we've, we've just discussed. Um, that's, that, that's the number that, will, that, you'll, that uh, will start to precipitate those symptoms. And so what are your causes? One of its wrist position. So that wrist position could be either from the fracture or post-reduction. So for example, the picture on the left is a, is a common way a, a wrist might present. So obviously you see the deformity there of the wrist. That, could, that in and of itself can lend to increased pressure uh, um, on the median nerve. Or post-reduction, this cotton loader position on the right side uh, where the wrist is, uh, wrist is, uh, is um, placed in a hyperflexion, typically hyperflexion, ulnar deviation, a bit of traction, but as you can imagine, that's putting a lot of pressure on the carpal tunnel. That's doing a fixed phalanx test, if you will. So that's another thing that can cause it. So you can get it from just the deformity pre-reduction or post-reduction. I saw a patient recently who had a sugar tongue splint applied and the mold at the, at the wrist level was so uh, pronounced that there was only about an, a two, two or three centimeters of space between the two ends of the plaster. So right there, the mold was, the, was placed. And again, that's, that's an iatrogenic uh, acute CTS in that situation because of a, a too aggressive uh, reduction in molding. Other causes are anatomic alteration of the carpal tunnel. So some, what change, something that changes the anatomy. So the obvious thing that changes the anatomy is the fracture. So there's a fracture there. The carpal tunnel has been altered. Um, uh, so you have some deformity, um, um, you've got comminution, uh, you've got swelling, you've got actual uh, maybe cortices actually um, putting direct pressure on uh, the nerve uh, itself. So in this picture here, I don't know if it shows up that well, I should have highlighted it. But if you look here, this is the median nerve, you can see how edematous it is, and this is actually a cortical fragment uh, um, putting relatively close pressure upon the nerve itself. And the other, other main cause of acute CTS is fluid. So fundamentally, uh, it's a pressure situation. So besides the anatomic causes or the positional causes, if there's fluid in the carpal tunnel, that too can cause acute CTS symptoms. So what are those? You can get the most obvious thing is just hematoma bleeding into the carpal tunnel uh, because there's a fracture there. Other reasons is just edema. Uh, 
um, that can happen from the fracture or perhaps other causes, be it the way it's immobilized, maybe it's dependent, maybe it's a polytrauma situation with more injuries proximally, or perhaps it's iatrogenic where too much anesthe anesthesia was actually injected into the area uh, to help control, uh, to facilitate a potential block, and that can also potentially hasten um, uh, or uh, precipitate acute CTS. How do you diagnose it? So if you have someone, they have a fracture of the wrist, um, have the distal radius, and they're and complaining of progressive numbness and tingling in the thumb, index, and middle fingers. It's bothersome. It's even painful. What can you do? Well, it's, it, you can put a needle in it if you want. You can put a striker needle in it if you want, and there's nothing wrong with that technically, but for the most part, this is a clinical diagnosis. Um, this is a diagnosis based on just the, the examination findings, analogous to a compartment syndrome. Again, you can place a needle in there but not necessary to be done. So it's a clinical diagnosis for the most part. So the real, the real challenge in this, in, with this problem is timing and uh, timing to treatment and then ultimately how to treat it. So we're gonna talk about briefly both of those things. So in terms of timing, um, the, the first step to do is a, a provisional reduction uh, if possible. Um, um, if, if, the, if the clinical circumstances allow it, so if you take the picture uh, demonstrated here, there's uh, significant comminution and displacement and deformity. Uh, you can imagine here uh, this spike right there causing a little bit of trouble. Um, so if you can improve that alignment, you can improve that, correct some of that deformity, that it, in and of itself can uh, potentially um, abate and improve some of that, that uh, nerve compression and, uh, and swelling. The next question then is uh, what to do surgically. So uh, assuming that the symptoms are ongoing or only somewhat ameliorated by a reduction, then you're looking at doing something surgically. So the main question that comes up is how quickly do you take a patient in the operating room for this? And frankly, there's nothing absolutely written in stone in this, but with all neurovascular injuries, timing is of the essence because there is an element of nerve injury, if you will. So you have to make a clinical decision as to how fast you get to the operating room, but uh, if you feel like the symptoms are progressive, the deformity is great in terms of your ability to uh, not adequately uh, correct this uh, bedside or in the emergency room, you want to go relatively quickly. My main advice is if you have someone that has acute CTS and or you're sus suspicious of acute CTS, don't send those patients home. If you're not taking them, if you don't think you need to take them that day or that night, you want to keep an eye on those patients. You want to make sure that they're with you, uh, where you're, you and your, your staff can keep an eye on them and you can move more expeditiously to the operating room if you need to, depending on what the dynamics are. So again, the, the, the key is there's no hard and fast time, but the key is you want to go relatively expeditiously and you want to keep an eye on these patients. Um, in terms of what to do then, well, assuming you're going to fix the fracture, uh, the, 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 um, the primary goal is, is, is not only fixing the fracture, but releasing the nerve. And there's really three ways you can go about releasing the nerve in the setting of a disarraised fracture. We've had a couple of excellent talks on different ways to fix these. You can fix a disarraised fracture with an X fixed, with a volar plate, with a dorsal spanning plate, with a dorsal plate, fragment specific, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's probably a dozen very reasonable ways to fix a distal raised fracture, and, and that's a talk for another day. But frankly, all of those techniques are more than appropriate and have been validated in the literature as long as they're applied the right way to the right fracture pattern. So the issue in this is not how to fix the fracture, but how to address the nerve along with the fracture itself. So whichever way you want to fix the fracture is great, but you want to address the carpal tunnel. So because only because the most common way we're fixing these fractures is with a volar plate, not because I'm advocating for, but that it is the reality is the most common way we're fixing these. I'll use that as our kind of backdrop. So you're going to fix this fracture with the volar plate. How do you want to how do you want to release that car, uh, carpal tunnel and median nerve as well? Well, there's three ways. One is basically doing an extensile carpal tunnel release. So basically, you're doing the traditional. Uh, long form carpal tunnel release where you have the initial uh, distal part of the incisions right where you normally would in the base of the palm uh, in line with the third web space and you extend that across the wrist and into the distal uh, volar forearm in an oblique fashion. This is just a limit incision on the right uh, but that was an extended further proximally. But what that does is give you a very extensile release of uh, the median nerve and you can take that as proximal as you need to depending upon uh, your 
um, the amount of swelling that you need to decompress and the amount of the nerve you need to decompress. And then through that same exposure, once you've released the, the median nerve, you then take the median nerve structures and the flexor tendon structures and you bring them over uh, ulnarly and you proceed down to the radius like you normally would. So this is an extensile carpal tunnel release approach where it, would, where it addresses both the median nerve as well as uh, the, um, uh, the uh, it gives you access to the fracture. And frankly, some of the traditional ways of uh, treating uh, disraised fractures vulnerably routinely use this technique. We don't routinely use this technique now because it requires uh, nerve exposure and potentially causes nerve injury, either primarily or postoperatively with just a swelling and bruising and scarring that can happen. So that's a, that's a very reasonable option, though, in the setting of a, a disraised fracture with acute CTS. The second way is just using a two incision approach, and this is probably the more common way nowadays to do this, where you approach both the carpal tunnel and the distal radius separately like you would individually. So you approach the carpal tunnel through your incision where you normally place it. This is not my image. That's a little ulnar from where I place my incisions, but that's okay. I know a lot of people place their car carpal tunnel incisions ulnarly, but you do your, your standard carpal tunnel release. You make sure you're satisfied with it, and then you go and, uh, and repair your distal radius. If you're going to use this volar approach, you just want to make sure that your fascial, there's no fascial bridge in, in this area here uh, that deep that you're connecting and decompressing both the carpal tunnel and the forearm fascia adequately and bringing them two together. So you can use a two incision technique. The third way is what's called a hybrid FCR approach where you can release the carpal tunnel uh, through your standard uh, distal radius approach, your volar Henry or your trans FCR, whatever you want to refer to it as or how you go about it. Um, and once you do that exposure, you can actually track up the FCR um, distally and there's two, there's two leaflets, a deep limb and a, and a superficial limb around the FCR, which becomes contiguous with the carpal tunnel. Um, that's another way to release uh, the carpal tunnel. I do not advocate for this way. It's been shown to work. Um, I think that in the setting of an acute CTS, and, and if you're not comfortable with this technique, it's probably not the best way to go. I think you want to be, uh, you want to leave the operating room pretty confident that you've released that carpal tunnel. With this, uh, it's not as obvious always that you've released it. So I find this a very nice technique for exposure purposes where you can, you can release your carpal tunnel intraoperatively to increase some of your exposure, particularly to bring your tendons more ulnar. But I think in terms of managing acute CTS may not be the preferred way. But, uh, but if, if you're comfortable doing it and you're experienced with it, uh, it is a viable approach potentially uh, to, uh, to treat acute CTS in the setting of a disarrays fracture. So those are three ways. Um, so just kind of in summary, acute carpal tunnel syndrome in the setting of a disarrays fracture. Incidence, about 5 to 8% of cases. Risk factors are cases that are higher energy or, or greater displacement. Presentation, it's like carpal tunnel syndrome, but it's a little bit more painful. Same distribution, but more painful and more progressive. Causes are ultimately pressure, uh, be it from a wrist position, be it from uh, altered anatomy within the carpal tunnel, or be it because of excess fluid in the carpal tunnel. The diagnosis is predominantly clinical. You can put a needle in it, but not necessary. And then treatment is uh, provisionally reduced if possible, but uh, uh, take to the operating room expeditiously uh, to decompress uh, that nerve. All right, so we'll stop there.